Deuteronomy chapter 8, beginning of verse 1, the Bible reads, All the commandments which I command thee this day shall ye observe to do, that ye may live and multiply, and go in and possess the land which the Lord uh, sware unto your fathers. <clears throat> and thou shalt remember all the way which the Lord thy God led thee these forty years in the wilderness to humble thee and to prove thee and to know what was in thine heart, whether thou wouldest keep his commandments or no. So it's interesting there in verse 2, God says, uh, thou wilt rem and thou shalt remember all the way which the Lord thy God led thee these 40 years. So we have to think about the fact that he's dealing with this generation that's about to pass over into the promised land. And he's talking to a group of people who have seen a lot of things, not just what they saw coming up out of Egypt. But you have to remember, they watched the previous generation perish in the wilderness. And when you kind of look there at the end, you know, God reminds them, look, the same thing can happen to you. Just like these nations that are being cast out before you, you know, the same thing will happen to you if you do not obey me, if you don't uh, keep my commandments and do all the things that I command you to do. If you start to go after these other gods, you know, you're going to end up in the same boat. Which should show us that you know, just because you're God's people, just because you know, you're, you're saved today, you know, doesn't make you exempt from suffering God's chastening or God's punishment. God still chastens and God still punishes. And really that is uh, the theme of this chapter. God uh, just again warning him, bringing up some of the same warnings that we've seen over and over again. Uh, we talked about a few weeks ago uh, where he was warning against the prosperity that they were going to inherit you know, vineyards they didn't plant. They were going to live in houses they didn't build. And God was saying, look, don't forget that I was the one that gave you all these things. And you see that same, uh, that same warning there. He's saying, look, let, lest thou say by thine own hand, I have gotten me this wealth. So this is, again, just kind of repeating. There's a, lot of, there's a lot of redundancy in the book of Deuteronomy, but for good reason. God is bringing up these same warnings. God is trying to drive home these points. Because you have to remember, this was a reality for these people. They really were going to go in and inherit these vineyards and these lands and, and these olive yards. They really were going to have all this great wealth given to them. And they really were going to face the temptation of being drawn away after other gods and worshiping false gods. And it, it was a real possibility for them to be uh, led into idolatry and have to suffer the punishments. So that's why God is just drilling this over and over and over again in the book of Deuteronomy. But what I want us to kind of focus in there in verse 2 is where he says, And thou shalt remember all the way which the Lord thy God led thee. And that's a real important concept for us to remember as well as we go through the Christian life, as we live, as we start to get some years behind us, is not to forget how far we've come. I know I preached this morning about not looking back, and, and that's definitely true. We don't want to be looking back. We want to keep our eyes forward as the sermon uh, you know, admonished us this morning. But we, it's also, you know, that's not to say sometimes it isn't good to just step back and reminisce and remember how far you've come and to think about where you were. You know, that can be a very encouraging thing for some people to stop and, and just remember all the way which the Lord thy God hath brought you. And it might even be, if you remember back, you might even remember a season where God was dealing with you very severely. You know, you might, you might be tempted to go back into some old sin or something like, like that. Like he's kind of warning them here, hey, don't follow a false God. You know, maybe that might be a temptation. It might do you well to stop and just think back to the last time that happened. And God had to, you know, come down on you. And then you say, whoa, I don't want to experience that again. You know, kind of just like a man would chasten his son, as it says, you know. Uh, you know, we, we, our, our children don't start behaving because they, well, they want to please us. They start behaving because they don't like the, plain, the pain that is associated with certain behaviors. They don't like to, you know, when mom says no, they, you know, they start ducking, right? And they, they know what's coming next, right? They, they don't want to have to deal with that. Now, they do grow to the place where they hopefully start to obey us because they love us, they want to please us. But it's the same way with us. You know, sometimes it's good for us just to remember how far God brought us, remember the way God has dealt with us in the past, you know, to prevent us from going into sin or things like that. But also not to just remember, you know, how far you've come in the Christian life. I think some people really sell themselves short sometimes. They think, well, I'm not the Christian I, I should be. And, you know, the, you know, we could probably all say that about ourselves. You know, none of us is ever going to reach... Uh, you know, this, this I, no, no, one, no one's ever going to be the perfect Christian, right? But, you know, you could probably take some encouragement. Are you a better Christian than you were a year ago? I mean, we're coming up on the new year. It's starting, maybe it's time to start thinking about those kind of things. What goals are we going to have to where we look back, we can remember the way the Lord has brought us this last year, this last five years, this last ten years. Can we look back and say we're a better Christian than before? Now, he says here to them, he says, Remember all the way which I have led you, and he says, in the wilderness, right? So for them, when they were reminiscing, when they're looking back and remembering where God took them, you know, it was probably a little bit more of a, 
not as a pleasant of a memory. You know, watching everyone die, watching you know their the previous generation. You know, and to us it's just you know people in a book. But to them it was actually people. It was aunts, uncles, moms, dads. It was people they knew and loved. And they understood why God had to do that, but they still had to go through that. And God saying, "Hey, well, you need to remember that. You need to think about that." Remember what I did in the wilderness when I led you all these 40 years in the wilderness. You know, it's, it's not always easy sometimes. We wonder why God is leading us through this path, why God has taken us on the journey that he has. And it's not easy. But you have to remember that God always has a purpose in his leading. If we're following God and we're just gonna committed to uh, his leading in our life, you know, he might take us through some wildernesses. And we would question why. We'd say, why is God doing this? But we have to understand that he has a purpose. And the purpose here, of course, with these people, and often even with our own selves, it was to humble thee, he goes on and says. You will remember all the way that I brought thee through the wilderness uh, these 40 years to humble thee and to prove thee and to know what was in thine heart. So he says, look, sometimes uh, you know, God might bring us through a hard season in our life, might bring us through a type of wilderness to humble us. Because we can get too puffed up, you know, we can start thinking we're more than we really are, and God has to bring us down a notch and, and remind us of, of the fact that, you know, we're really not all that in a bag of chips sometimes, you know. Uh, we, need to, we need to get humbled because, uh, you know, uh, God resists the proud, you know, and he's not a respecter of persons. So he said he brought them through the wilderness to humble them and also to prove thee, he says, and to know what was in thine heart. And I really like that. God says, you know, I did this to prove you. And now, not to, he's not saying in the sense I did this to prove something to you. He's saying he did that to test you to see what you're really made of, to see what's really on the inside, to know what's in your heart. And, you know, that's, a, that's something that we have to keep in mind. Maybe sometimes we'll see people or we ourselves are going through some great difficulty or great trial. It might just be because God's trying to see what you're made of. God's trying to test your metal. God's trying to see you know, what you're really made of, to know what's in thine heart. Because here's the thing, it's real easy to say you're going to follow God no matter what, you love God. But when something comes up, you know, when things get tough, when you have to go through some trial, some wilderness, you know, that's when a lot of people kind of fall out of the way. You know, just kind of like when Jesus, you know, uh, you know, told them, and people, you know, they turned away and they went no longer with him. You know, because this was a hard saying. You know, that a man must, he has to love him more than father or mother. And, and you know, that was a very unique uh, uh, time, of course. But the point being that, you know, we, if we go through some difficult time, it's because we're being proven, perhaps. You know, maybe it's a result of our own sin. Maybe it's a result of our own, you know, foolishness or whatever it might be. But it could also be that God is leading through us through that wilderness to prove what's in our heart. Because here's the thing, and this is a phrase I think of a lot, is talk is cheap. Talk is cheap. And that's true in the Christian life, too. People can talk a lot about how they love God and how they're going to serve God, that they'll never turn from God, that, you know, and it's real easy to say that stuff when, when the going's good. But when the things start to get rough, that's when you start to see who, what people are really made of. You know, when, 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 uh, when, when, things, when, the, when the boat starts to rock and the waves start getting a little higher, you start to see who's going to just, you know, jump ship. So I think that's what he's saying here. You know, that's something we can learn from this. Why does God lead us through the wilderness? To humble us, to prove us, to know what's in our heart, to prove thee, to know thee. And then he goes on there in verse 3 and says, and he humbled thee. <clears throat> so, you know, mission accomplished. <laughs> it worked. You know, say, why was God do that? Because it does humble people. That's why God leads through these wildernesses in our lives. That's why God takes his people through these difficult places. You know, mission accomplished. Now, <clears throat> You know, that's, that's not a pleasant experience if you ever go through it in life. That's not something that's fun. But it's necessary because of the results that it brings. Because he says he humbled thee. Now, how did he go about, hung how about, he go about humbling them? Well, he says there, he uh, suffered thee to hunger. Right? And meaning this, he allowed you to go hungry. That, that God said, you know what? It's fine for you to miss a meal. That I'm going to take you out in this barren wilderness where there's no food, where there's no water, and see what, how you react. And of course, we know the story of how they reacted. They murmured and they complained against Moses. They spake of stoning him. And, and God had to rebuke them. But God, you know, he will allow pain into our lives. God will allow us to suffer. You say, well, you know, that question, why do good things happen to, or, or why do bad things happen to good people? Why does that happen? Well, it's because God knows that pain produces results. 
as, as you know, as uh, unsnowflakey as that sounds, as, uh, you know, as, unpolitic as you know, unpolitically correct as that sounds, that is the truth. Is that when we, uh, we are made better by suffering, when you go through some hard thing. Now, of course, we want to avoid that as, as much as we can. We don't want to bring more suffering upon ourselves than is necessary through sin and other things. But, you know, there are circumstances in life that God allows into our lives that produce some kind of pain. And, not, and I'm not saying physical, although that might be sometimes through an illness or things, something like that. But emotional pain, you know, the things that we feel, things, things we have to go through. And uh, we probably all know people, you know, that have gone through some very difficult things in life. I know I know people that have gone through some very difficult things in life and I, that I've never gone through. And I say, I, I, you know, I don't know. <laughs> How would I react? How would I handle that situation? And I've seen people handle it very well. I've seen people go through very difficult things and be very gracious and loving God through it all and, and, and being able to see the good in it. And, uh, you know, they're an inspiration to others and they, they motivate us. And, uh, you know, that's why God allows these things to happen. He allows these things to prove us and, and to humble us. And He does it by allowing us to suffer, to allowing us to go without. So don't avoid discomfort. Don't live your life just trying to avoid every uh, bit of discomfort that you can. And really, that's what the world will teach you. The world will say, hey, you shouldn't have to suffer anything at all. You know, no one should ever have, you should never have to hear any mean things said to you. You should always get what you want. You know, you're, you're a special snowflake and everyone just, you just deserve the best of everything. And you, you know, but that's not God's philosophy. God leads his people through wilderness. God leads his people and, and allows them to suffer, allows them to go through hunger, to prove them and to test them. And ultimately, and we'll see here in a minute, to yes, provide for them, and even in all that. It's not that God is, you know, you know locking you up in some camp and, and starving you to death, but God allows us to go through lean seasons in our life to prove us and to show us uh, what we're really made of. And you say, well, I don't know about that. Okay, well, let's think about several examples. You know, we could start off with Job. Right? That should be the most famous example that we could probably all think of. Of a man suffering great loss in his life. The wealthiest man of his time. Loses everything. Loses his house. Loses his family. Loses all of his riches. Loses everything in a day. One day. And then he's afflicted with boils and sickness. And, 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 but what did he say? Though he slay me, yet will I serve him. Right. You know, The Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Naked came I into this world and naked shall I return hither. And gave glory to God through it. So he's an example of that. Of God allowing suffering to come into his life to prove what was in him. And that's what God said of Job. I know him. And that he is a righteous man. What about Paul? Think about all the things that Paul suffered for Christ. God allowed all those things to happen. But it, what did it do? It produced results. He went, I, mean, the, I mean, people say he's the greatest Christian that ever lived. And I'm not going to argue that. <laughs> I mean, did more for the cause of Christ in his time than probably anybody ever has or will do. You think about our Lord himself, the Jesus Christ. I mean, he suffered great things. Why? Because of the, he went through all that pain because of what it produced, what it brought forth. So he says, you know, he, in, the, in these beginning verses that he, 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 them to, he wants them to remember this, how they went through a wilderness and that they were humbled and that they were proven and that God allowed them to suffer hunger. And he goes on and he says there in verse 4, and he says, And fed thee with manna. And he says, Thy raiment waxed uh, not old. <coughs> Excuse me, that was in verse 3. And he says in verse 3, And he humbled thee and suffered thee hungry and fed thee with manna. So he says, you know, hey, I caused thee to suffer with hunger. And that's true. And then he's fed thee with manna. And sometimes God allows us to go through and go without so that we'll turn to him for the provision that we need. And God keeps us lean so that we'll go to Him for, to make up the difference. Because then He gets the glory for it, and we know that it was God that did it. So, <coughs> He says, I fed thee with manna. So, yes, God allows us to suffer, but it's so that He can you know, be that source of provision. So that He can prove, show you, hey, I can help you through any wilderness. And, you know, and David said, and, you know, He prepares a table for me in the midst of mine enemies. And, and, and uh, God, that's what God is showing us here. So, and that's kind of the theme of this chapter, and that's really the experience that he's rehearsing of this generation. And he kind of goes on there and just kind of rehearses all, all that happened there. If you look there in verse 11, he says, Beware 
that thou forget not uh, the Lord thy God in not keeping his commandments and his judgments and his statutes which I command thee this day, lest thou, when thou eaten and art full, and hast built goodly houses and dwelled therein, and when thy herds and thy flocks multiply, and thy silver and thy gold is multiplied, and all that thou hast is multiplied, then thine heart be lifted up, and thou forget the Lord thy God, which brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage, who led thee through that great and terrible wilderness, wherein were fiery serpents and scorpions and drought, and there was no water, who brought thee forth water out of the rock of the flint. So when God says he brought them through a wilderness, he describes it. You know, we get a good, clear picture of what it was like. It was great and terrible. You know, great, it was very vast. It was a very big wilderness. It was a terrible wilderness, wherein were fiery serpents and scorpions and drought, and there was no water. This place sounds really familiar. I'm just trying to, it reminds me of some other place I know. Anyway, and he goes on, uh, he brought thee forth water out of the rock of the flint, who led thee in the wilderness with manna, which thy fathers knew not, that he might humble thee, and he might prove thee to do thee good at thy latter end. You know, there's always that blessing that's waiting for us if we'll go through that trial. It's not that God always just wants to keep us down and hold us down. It's that God allows these things to come into our life. We suffer, then he provides, and, we, and, if, we're, and if we do right, and, we, and when God proves us, we do right, he blesses us at, at the end. Just like Job. Right. He had more at his latter end than he did at the beginning. Everything was given back to him, and then some. <coughs> and he goes on, and he says there, uh, and <coughs> uh, in verse 17, And thou say in thine heart, My power and the might of mine hand hath gotten me this wealth. But thou shalt remember the Lord thy God, for it is he that giveth thee power to get wealth, and that he may establish his covenant which he sware unto thy fathers, as it is this day. So, <coughs> he's saying, look, what God is saying here is he doesn't want these people to stop relying on him. He doesn't want them to get into this, this good land and start having all these blessings and having this every all this increase of their flocks, all the increase of the gold and have no need of anything and then forget God and stop relying on God. Because when we start to forget God and <laughs> then you know we start doing our own thing and nothing ever good comes of that. Uh, that's when you start going into sin and they and here they go into idolatry and all kinds of wickedness in a few generations. And that's why God allows us to go through those wildernesses. You know, sometimes before we get a blessing, sometimes God will take us through a valley before you get to see the mountain. And that's because when you get there, you know, God has made an impression and reminded you already of, you know, where everything comes from, where all this is coming from. Not your own, not your own hand. It's God. And, uh, you know, it reminds me of people who, uh, you know, who, who own, the, uh, you know, maybe start their own business. You know, they start a business uh, from scratch, you know, and they're doing well, they're prospering in their business. But, you know, what some, t some people fail to see is all the lean years that those people went through. All the time they spent, you know, as an apprentice somewhere, even learning their craft. You know, up at all hours of the night, working all kinds of uh, hours throughout the week. And, uh, you know, and, 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 and going through all of that. You know, suffering, you know, going through a, a type of wilderness. You know, and, and they, but they appreciate the value of what they have when they finally do make it. When they finally do are able to strike on their own and succeed. You know, they remember everything that they went through. And it's kind of the same, the same thing. You know, they, 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 uh, when we start to succeed in our Christian life, when we start to, you know, get some wisdom and some experience and we start to, uh, you know, do well and, and succeed and have some victories, it'd be really easy to sit back and say, well, you know, this is all my hand. I'm the one. I, I'm the one who's got the brains here. I'm the one that figured this out. When really it was God. When God had you over here, you know, dazed and confused and not knowing what's going on. And, and that's when he taught you uh, uh, how to rely on him. And that's what God was really trying to impress, I believe, on these people. Is like, look, I did all these things. You saw what happened in the wilderness. Don't forget what happened. Because he knows they're going to go in and all these blessings are going to come upon him. And the temptation and human nature is to forget God. So in order to accomplish uh, this, you know, uh, we must come to uh, rely on the Lord through weakness. <coughs> and if you would, let's go ahead and turn over to uh, Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. In order to come to the place where you understand that it's God that sees you through the good times and the bad, you know, you have to 
he taught that by going through bad times. You know, you actually have to experience that for yourself. And, you know, life itself has a way of just kind of bringing us through that. Even without God, you know, necessarily having to intervene, though he often does. If you look there at Hebrews chapter 11, I'll remind us of what it says in, in 2 Timothy 2. It says, Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. You know, that's something we have to be prepared for in the Christian life. We talked about this morning how the Christian life is likened unto a, a race, but you know, Paul often also likened it unto a warfare. And there's nothing pleasant about war. War is a very difficult thing. War is a very hard thing. And it takes endurance if you're going to be able to make it through that, if you're going to be successful for that. And that's why Paul is telling th Timothy to endure hardness because hardness you know, is, is, is bound to come. He didn't say run away from hardness. He didn't say shelter yourself from any discomfort. You know, avoid any a difficult situation. He said, no, endure it. Go through it. Experience it. Get to know it. Here in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 32, it says in Hebrews 11, 32, uh, <clears throat> What shall I say more for the time would fail, uh, fail me to tell of Gideon and of Barak and of Samson and of Jephthah, of David also and Samuel and of the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouth of lions, quenched the violence of the fire, uh, fire, escaped the edge of the sword. We love all that, don't we? We love all these are great stories. We would love to go through all this, right? Maybe be able to do some of that, you know, subdue a kingdom. Who hasn't wanted to do that, right? That's, you know, that's where you get these games like Risk. You know, you want to subdue a kingdom. Right? Well, that's probably as much as we'll get of that. You know, right, rot righteous, obtain promises, stop the mouths of lions. I mean, that, that would be fun, right? Quetch the violence of fire and escape the edge of the sword. But what about this one? Out of weakness, we're made strong. You know, do we really want to be brought to that place where God makes us weak so that he can make us strong? But that's what happens, and that's how God works. God brings us into the, these weak places in our lives to show us, to prove us, to test us, to allow, he allows us to suffer hunger and go through these things so that we can be made strong and go through that so that he can show him himself strong on our behalf. <clears throat> now, if you would go back to Deuteronomy, we'll kind of move on here because you can't really talk about Deuteronomy uh, chapter 8, verse 3 without kind of showing this here. And that's the correlation between manna and the word of God because he says there in verse 3, he humbled thee and suffered thee to hunger and fed thee with manna. Okay, and we all know the story how God brought manna down from heaven, which thou knewest not, and uh, that he might, uh, <coughs> neither did thy fathers know, that he might make thee to know that man doth not live by bread only, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. So you kind of see this correlation where he's saying, look, I fed you with manna so that you would know that you don't live by, br by, by bread alone but by every word out of the man, uh, uh, out of, uh, out of the, that comes out of the mouth of God doth man live. So there's kind of this correlation between the manna and the word of God. You know, he's saying it's kind of, we look in the scriptures, it kind of represents the word of God. That manna represents that, the word of God. And, uh, of course, the purpose of the physical manna, right, was to show our reliance on God's word. They had a physical reliance on the manna, of course. But what it shows us today, spiritually speaking, is that we rely upon the Word of God as a spiritual meat. You know, back then they needed that for a, an actual physical meat to sustain them. But in the same way today, we need to, 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 we don't live on bread only. Nothing's changed. You know, we also need to live by the very Word of God. And uh, that spiritual meat that we need is found in the Word of God. If you think about it, you know, uh, that, that also pictures Christ, the manna. Jesus said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. He's talking about the manna, right? And what is he called? He's called the Word of God. So there's a correlation there that, the, that, re that is representative of the Word of God. It's representative of Christ as well. Let's go over to uh, Exodus chapter 16. Exodus chapter 16, and we'll actually read about the story. Because when we understand that, when we see that there is indeed a correlation there, he's saying, look, manna, the Word of God, uh, that, that, that exist and that it's representative of the Word of God, you know, we can learn some things about the Word of God by reading the story uh, where the manna came down. In Exodus chapter 16 and verse 13, it says, And it came to pass uh, that at the even the quails come up and covered the camp, and in the morning the dew lay uh, around about the host, 
And when the dew lay upon was gone up, behold, upon the face of the wilderness there was a small round thing, as small as the hor a horror of uh, frost on the ground. And when the children of Israel saw it, they said one to another, It is manna, for they wist not what it was. And Moses said unto them, This is the bread which the Lord give, hath given you to eat. This is the thing which the Lord hath commanded. Gather it every man according to his eating, and omer for every man according to the number of your persons, that ye may uh, ye every man uh, take ye every man for them which are in your tents. And the children of Israel did so, and they gathered some more and some less. And when they did meet it with an omer, he that gathered much had nothing over, and he that gathered little had no lack. And every man and they gathered every man according to his eating. And uh, Moses said, Let no man leave of it till the morning, notwithstanding. They hearken not unto Moses, but some uh, of them left it until the morning, and it bred worms, and they and stank, and Moses was wroth, uh, wroth with them. And they gathered it every morning, every man according to his eating, and when the sun waxed hot, it melted. So, a very interesting story, but how does it relate to the Word of God? So, the way it relates, you know, or what we can learn from this in a, in a, few, in a few ways is that, first of all, they were told to gather it in the morning. He said, look, you're going to go out early in the morning when the dew lifts off the ground, it's there. So that's something that's done in the morning. You know, that's a, that's a good principle for us when it comes to Bible reading. That's a great time to read your Bible is early in the morning. You know, start your day with the Scripture. Now, I understand that people's schedules are different. Not everybody can do that all the time. But if it's possible, I highly recommend it. That, you know, the first thing you lay your eyes on, instead of a screen or some other book or whatever... You know, would be the Word of God, and get that spiritual manna first thing in the morning. Because what happens is the wax comes, or the sun comes up, and it wax hot and melts away. That time is precious, you know, and that, that's that time during the day when we aren't really bothered, you know, especially if you have children, especially if you have young children. Now, if they're real young, it doesn't matter what time of day it is; <laughs> they'll disturb you at any hour, right? But uh, you know, generally speaking, that's a great time for people to be able to get up before anybody else has gotten up, before everything gets crazy in the house, with the kids running around and everything else. Before we go off to work and, and our day gets busy, you know, take a moment to get some spiritual manna in your gut and, and, and go on that strong, that meat of the word that will carry you through the day. And that's a great principle to learn from this story. Job said, I have esteemed thy words, uh, the words of his mouth, more than my necessary food. He said, look, you're the, this, was more, this spiritual food was more important to me than physical food. That's what Job said. It was more important to me to get up and get in the Word of God than it was to pour a bowl of Wheaties and, and eat that. It would do you more good to get in this spiritually than anything else. Now the Bible says in Proverbs 8, Blessed is the man that heareth me watching daily at my gate, gates, waiting at the posts of my doors. I mean that, and that's you know when when wisdom comes out in the morning, will they find? Will she find us waiting? When that time comes, you know, are we going to be there, ready to receive from the word, from God what He has for us for that day? You know, are we watching at His post? Are we waiting at the gate early in the morning? Watching daily, are we there? Because again, you know, that spiritual manna when the day gets busy and that hot sun comes up, it's gone. I'll read my Bible later. I'm, I got to get going. Next thing you know, it's 9 o'clock at night. You can hardly keep your eyes open, and you've got a whole day of work tomorrow. You've got to go to bed, and, and, and you've missed that time. You know, and that can become habitual. <coughs> now, it says in verse 16 there, it says, They gathered of it every man according to his eating, an omer for every man. So this is measured. This manna was measured out. And what I get from this is that, you know, you should, you should measure your reading. And, you know, this could really, I've preached about this in the past, like how to actually go about reading through the Bible. And one way to do that is to, you know, mark out what you're going to read every day. Yep. You know, how, what's your goal? You know, again, New Year's is coming, right? Everyone's going to start their Bible reading goals. How many times are you going to read it this next year? Did you meet your goals this year? Did you read more? Did you read less than you wanted to? You know, one thing that's going to help you is if you measure it out. You say, hey, I'm going to read X amount of pages today. And I highly recommend doing it that way. To read a number of pages and not a number of chapters. And a lot of people who try to read, I'm going to read X amount of chapters every day. You know, what's going to happen when you get to Psalm 119? <laughs> you know, and you still got another eight chapters to go. You know, some chapters are longer than others and others are shorter. But, you know, the pages are all the same. 
So that's a really good way, you know, measure it out. Say, hey, if I read, you know, 10 or 15 pages a day, you know, I'm going to read it X amount of times. Everyone's Bible's different, you know, unless you got the same one. But you, you say, I've got this many pages in the Old Testament, this many pages in the New. Divide that by 365. That's how many pages you have to read one in, uh, a day in order to read through it once. You know, like this, and this one, this was great. I loved it when this was my daily reader because the New Testament is 365 pages long. So I knew if I read one page a day, I'd get through the New Testament once a year, which in my opinion is nowhere near enough, <laughs> right? But uh, I knew if, hey, if I read 12 pages, I'd get through it 12 times a year. I'd get through it once a month. You know, but the point being, and you'd have to decide what you need to read for yourself. You know, people, you know, uh, are in different, uh, you know, positions in life and, and, and ages in life, you know, th that they have to kind of determine uh, what is appropriate, has how much they need to or should be reading. But, uh, you know, the point being, measure it out and figure out how much do you need to read? How much is an omer for you? You know, uh, that, that, that's going to be appropriate. <coughs> so, have a goal and determine the daily amount. You know, you say, well, I don't know, that sounds like a lot of work. Well, you know, here's the alternative, starve. Go ahead and starve spiritually then. I don't have time to read my Bible. Okay, well then just go starve spiritually. And, and don't be surprised when you're this spiritually emaciated person with no strength. Well, why not? Because you haven't been eating. You haven't been getting in there. You're, you're, you're starving to death. You're skin and bone spiritually. And uh, that's, you know, that's the alternative there. And not only that, but you also s will suffer the chastening that comes with it because ignorance is not an excuse with God. Well, I didn't, re I didn't know that, God. Well, you know, it was written in black and white. And you had a copy of it. And if you just read it, you would have known. If you'd, if you'd gotten to church and heard the preaching, you would have known. So ignorance is not an excuse. That's the alternative to saying, well, you know, Bible reading, that's such a boring topic to talk about. It's actually really important because, y you know, your whole spiritual life hinges on it. Uh, so that's why you want to take a minute and admonish one another to read our Bibles. So if you would, let's go back to Deuteronomy and let's look at, uh, let's pick it up in verse 5, chapter 8, verse 5, where it says, <coughs> it says in verse 5, Thou shalt consider in thine heart that as a man chasteneth his son, so the Lord thy God chasteneth me. So he's saying, look, you need to consider this in your heart that one, you know, he doesn't say, he doesn't just say, consider this, that God chastens you. Okay, he didn't say that. He said, as a man chasteneth his son, so God chasteneth thee. See, that's what he wants you to consider. Not the fact that God chastens, but it's how he does it. That God chastens as a father does his son. And so we have to ask ourselves, and if I should have told you to keep something in Hebrews, if you haven't, please turn back there. But how, and go to Hebrews 12. How does, God, how does a man chasten his son? And, uh, and one of the, f you know, you say, well, chastening, I don't know about that. That's, you know, that's Old Testament. Well, it's actually, we're admonished in the New Testament to consider the same thing. So let's bring it into Hebrews chapter 12, look at verse 4, where he says, Ye have not resisted unto blood, striving against sin. And have you forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children? My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. So again, what is it there that he says, uh, uh, he says, uh, m uh, he speaketh unto you as unto children, right? My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord. So as a man chasteneth his son, as a father would chasten his son. So how, how are, what is he trying to get across here by saying, look, it's, 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 the way God chastens you is in the same way as a man would chasten his son. That doesn't mean that God literally is going to come down here and take his belt off and, and tan some hides or have a paddle or, or a, you know, does God have a little plastic or wooden spoon for the little ones that he's going to, you know, wrap? No. He's saying here, look here in verse 6, For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. The way God chastens, the, 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 uh, the similarity between a man chastening his son and God chastening us is that it's done out of love. It's because why, do, why are we chastened by our parents? Because they love us. It's a loving thing to chasten somebody. Now, all the kids in the room are saying, are you sure about that? <laughs> are you sure? Because it doesn't feel very loving. When you get older and you start to see the heartache that those chastenings have spared you, you'll see how loving it really was. 
when you start to meet other people that grew up without that chastening and the lives that they're living because of a result of not understanding the, the, of, of uh, you know, uh, consequences that come with your actions, you know, you'll start to say, wow, my parents spared me. It hurt then, but it didn't hurt anywhere near as much as what these people are going through who were not chastened. So chastening uh, is a very loving act. And that's what God is saying here. As a man chasteneth his son, he's saying, look, I'm chastening you in a loving way. What I'm doing is very loving. Me taking you through the wilderness and punishing those people and causing you to suffer hunger and, and warning you about what I'll do if you don't obey, it's all loving. Because God wants you to, wants to spare you, just like a parent wants to spare their child. They don't want their little, you know, precious pumpkin to go running out into the highway because they don't stand a chance against a semi-tractor or whatever, right? So they, when, when Junior starts headed towards out the door, you know, he gets a crack and he begins to associate disobeying with pain, right? And he has to understand something, that that's a loving act. Yeah. The unloving person would go say, no, go ahead and touch the hot iron and find out for yourself. Go run out in the road and find out for yourself. Go mess around with sin and find out for yourself and suffer the consequences, many of which are permanent yep. and cannot be changed. So chastening is a loving act, and that's what the Bible says. And that's what God is trying to get across here to them. is like, look, I'm chastening you as a father does his son. I'm doing it because it's a loving act. The Bible says in Proverbs 13, 24, He that spareth his rod hateth his son. So the person who does not chasten their son, that's the person that is unloving. That's the person, in fact, the Bible says hates their child. I don't hate them, well, you know, but what you're doing is not loving. I don't hate them, that's why I don't, I don't spank them. Actually, the Bible says the complete opposite. That if you're going to spare your rod, if you're going to not chasten your child, that you actually hate them. But he that loveth him, the Bible says, chasteneth him betimes, meaning early. He gets after that kid early and starts to work on them early. The Bible says the rod of correction will... Uh, 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 uh. What is it? Yeah, the, 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 the rod of correction... Uh, foolishness is bound in the heart of the child, but the rod of correction will drive it far from him. And it's such an interesting thing when it says that it's bound in there. And I know I've brought this up, but I'm going to remind us again. It says it's bound in the heart of a child. And anyone who's had a child knows this is true. <laughs> that it's bound in there. You know, it's not, it's not that it's, it's not this little slip knot. You know, it's not just this, it's not, foolishness is just in there, just this dainty little decorative bow that you just pull a little string and, oh, the foolishness is gone. Man, I'm talking, it's in there like it's bound. You know, it's like, it's, it, you know, a, some sailor with giant arms came along and just <coughs> and tied that thing in there. You know, it's, it's tight and you're not going to just walk up to it and pull it apart and it's going to be so nice. You're going to have to take the rod and loosen it up and loosen it up, driving it, he says. He will drive it far from him. You know, it's not just something that you're, you're going to swat once and bam, it's, it's gone. It's something you have to drive out. It's a persistence. And, you know, that's the way sometimes God has to deal with us. You know, God has to chasten. And, but here's the thing. We always have to understand this, is that when we're being chastened, it's not because God hates us. It's because God loves us. And, you know, and kids, you know, in the room, I know we got a lot of them. The, it, you know, if, if you're being chastened by your parents, understand something. It's because they love you. Yeah. It's because they want the best for you. It's because they don't want you to make mistakes. Because they don't want you to get hurt. So they have to chasten you. So this generation here, it's particularly in, that we're reading about in Deuteronomy, they witnessed some chastening, didn't they? They witnessed what happened to the previous generation. They saw a big old whooping come down. They saw the earth open up and swallow people. <laughs> I mean, they saw fire come out from, the, from God and consume uh, the, uh, 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 the two sons of Aaron. I can't remember their names right now off the top of my head. But they saw some chastening, didn't they? They saw a whole generation perish in the wilderness. So they, got, you know, they might not have gotten all the, the direct chastening, but boy, they were, they were close enough. You know, they were close enough to feel the, 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 the draft as the paddle swung by, so to speak, right? They, got a good, they were close enough to know that they don't want any part of that. And it served as a warning. It served as a precaution to say, hey, look, don't make the same mistakes they made. 
you know, and hopefully that's what kids do when, when it comes to chastening. They start to figure out, well, you know, it's, it's action reaction. You know, when I do this, I get a spanking. So the solution, and I'm trying to explain this to the little ones. You know, it's bedtime. You're about to go to bed, okay? Do you want a spanking tonight? <laughs> no. Okay. Well, if you don't, I'm, I'm glad you don't because I'm not really looking forward to spanking anybody either. So since we both agree on that, that neither of us wants anything to do with spanking tonight, <laughs> here's what you need to do. You need to go to bed. Be quiet. Okay. <laughs> and don't say anything. Just be quiet. Okay, I can do that never happens <laughs> and it's not much longer it's like all right get the belt come out here I'm gonna deal with this remember what we talked about yeah all right well it didn't work out that way did it and then you try it again the next night you know and it's the same thing now eventually they start to get it you know and they every once in a while they need that gentle reminder but you know that's uh, that's that's the thing we should learn from these chastenings you know that's what God is saying in this chapter look you've been through the wilderness you've been you, you've been saw, you saw the hunger that was suffered. You saw these people get chased. Learn from this. And, and don't go after uh, these strange gods, he says in the, in the end there. <clears throat> and that's really what he was kind of warning them, you know, in verses 6 through 18. You know, I won't take the time to read all that again, but he's saying in verse 6, Therefore thou shalt keep the commandments of the Lord thy God. Why? Because of verse 5. Why is he saying you're going to keep, you, should, you shall keep the commandments of the Lord your God? Why? Thou shalt consider in thine heart that a man, as a man chasten his son, so the Lord chasteneth God, thy God chasteneth thee. He's saying, look, you know I chasten. You know I punish. You know this better than anybody. Therefore, in verse 6, Therefore thou shalt keep the commandments of the Lord thy God to walk in his ways and to fear him. For the Lord thy God bringeth thee into a good land, a land of brooks and of water and of fountains and depths, that spring out of valleys and hills, a land of wheat and barley and vines and fig trees and pomegranates, a land of oil, of oil, olive and honey, a land wherein thou shalt eat bread without scarceness, thou shalt not lack anything in it, a land whose stones and iron and out of whose hills thou mayest dig brass. He's saying, look, I know the, 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 the blessings of the land that are waiting for you. Don't forget me and don't forget a particular aspect of God that he chastens that he deals with sin and disobedience, that he doesn't just let it slide. As any loving parent does, they deal with it, they get involved, and they correct it. Now, it goes on there, and we'll just wrap it up here at the end. He says in verse 19, And it shall be, if thou do at all forget the Lord thy God, and walk after the other gods, and serve them, <laughs> I testify uh, against you this day that I'm going to let it pass. Because I understand people forget. Is that what God said? He said, no, if you forget, you're going to perish. That's what he says there. Ye shall surely perish as the nations which the Lord destroyeth before you, or before your eyes. He's saying, or before your face, excuse me. So, you know, he's saying here, like, for basically this, that, you know, forgetting is not an excuse. You know, I forgot doesn't fly with God. Because you shouldn't have forgotten. Because here's the thing, people think forgetting is something that just, just happens in and of itself. That's, that somehow forgetting is just something that happens to us. But what is it when we forget? Forgetting something is the result of failing to remember. You know, that's what it is. It's not just, I forgot because that's just what happens. It's because you failed to remember. That's why you forgot. You didn't take the time to make yourself remember that. I mean, think about all the things that we forget about that we know we're not supposed to. I mean, little things. You know, things that we say, I have to remember this. You know, for our jobs and things like that. What do we do if we don't want to forget them? We write them down. Right. We put a sticky note. Don't forget. We're being intentional about not forgetting. That's what all remembering is. Is being purpose, you know, purposely not forgetting. Forgetting is not an excuse because all forgetting tells somebody is that it wasn't important enough for you to remember. Being forgetful is not an excuse with God. And really, you know, you could take that into the work aspect of it, you know. It's not an excuse for most employers, at least any of the good ones, right? They tell you to do something. Hey, I need you to do this and this and this. And you come back hours later, oh, I forgot. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, you're right. Well, I guess I should have wrote that down for you. I should have reminded you. I should have called you later and said, hey, do you, you know, 
which some of them do if they know you're forgetful, you know, you're not <laughs> on top of the gang. So they'll, they will start, hey, did you forget? But here's the thing about forgetful employees. You know, if they don't get fired, they usually don't succeed. You know, and if you got one of those jobs where all you need is a pulse, they're out there, you know, then you go, then yeah, I guess in some jobs you can go be forgetful and still keep your job, but it's probably not a very good job. It's probably because they can't really find anybody else to do that job. Or they're just going to get more of the same if they try to find somebody else to replace you. But forgetful employees, you know, often they get fired from good jobs. That doesn't fly with employees or employers. You know, forgetting is not an excuse in the in, 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 in even in our secular world, and it's certainly not an excuse with God because all forgetting is is you failing to remember. And here's the thing: when you forget on God, it's it's not just, you know, you you, you know the, the the jug of milk stays at the grocery store, and you have to go get it tomorrow. You know, I forgot to get that on the way home. You know, it's not that. It, it, God's not just disappointed when you forget about Him. You know, you're, when you're forgetting about God and His commandments, you're forgetting something pretty important. Yeah. You're forgetting something pretty big in life. If you start to forget who God is and, and how God is and what God expects, if you just start to forget that, if you just say, well, that's not important enough for me to remember, it's not that God's just going to be disappointed. God's going to be angry. And God's going to be furious. The Bible says in Psalms 10, the wicked through the pride of his countenance will not seek after God. God is not in all his thoughts. It's a wicked thing to keep God out of your thoughts. To not be, remind, to be, not to be mindful of God. It's, it's, it's the proud, it's the wicked that do that. Isaiah 26 says, Thou will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee. You know, we want peace in life. We want God's blessing. Don't forget him. Keep your mind stayed on him. Remember the things that God expects. He says, whose mind is stayed on thee. Why? Because he trusteth me. So it says there in Isaiah 26, thou will keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusteth in thee. And why does this person trust in God? Because he remembers God. Right? He trusts in him because his mind has stayed on him. And as a result, God keeps him in perfect peace. So that tells me this, that the one who remembers the Lord is the one who trusts the Lord. You know, you're not, why would you need to, why would you ever trust or rely on God if you don't remember Him? If you don't ever keep your mind on Him, if you're not staying your mind on Him. So you know what God does? God allows suffering. That's what we were talking about, right? God allows the wilderness to come. God allows the chastening. He brings the chastening into our lives. He begins to execute judgment. He begins to chasten us as a man doth his son. To do what? To keep our minds fixed on Him so that we will trust Him and obey His voice. Let's go ahead and pray.